Hey guys, welcome back. Another podcast style video and this time we're going to be talking about weight saving. always um, a subject of a little uh, controversy just like uh, engine horsepower figures um, there's also uh, a lot of myths and untrue uh, stories about weight saving um, we weigh everything in the shop uh, absolutely everything uh, transmissions rear ends uh, motors complete cars bare chassis everything and then you find out couple really interesting uh, things um, for me it's always very important to get the weight distribution uh, right um, and I don't just mean front to back but also center of gravity and I feel that that's like something that a lot of people not really think about like you can see in the uh, past years uh, also because I think it's also fueled because of a lot of FD guys going to this setup and James Dean going to the setup and uh, what I'm referring to is moving the tank uh, above the rear axle uh, so your fuel cell instead of sitting behind the rear axle which was kind of like I, I would almost say an invention by HGK with the full tube frame uh, rears they were one of the first to do that um, and all Christophs cars had the fuel cell uh, down low right behind the differential and that was kind of like how most people made cars let's say five to ten years ago and then a couple of years ago I think three four years ago it was mass adopted that everybody was moving the um, uh, the fuel cell above the rear axle and move it further forward as you can see in my interview with Odie uh, with the build breakdown of that car you can also uh, see that uh, my cars, my both my pro cars have the tank still in the back, um, sitting pretty down low. Um, I think a lot of the FD guys also do it because these days you're really, really finely putting putting the, um, the back of the car in the wall. Although Chris Tops with the red and white HGK E46 also, I wouldn't say invented that, but with the Kevlar panels and stuff, like he really put that car really far into the wall. Um, fuel cell that we use which is about I would say it's eight eight or ten gallons um, uh, yeah for 45 liters so it's around 10 gallons that I use in both pro cars um, that sits pretty far from the rear bumper still so you can totally still wall scrape and everything um, but like that's like for me that's a really big consideration when we're talking about weight saving like I'm always looking at weight distribution first uh, and I said it before a lot of people ask me questions about that statement uh, that I'd rather have a car uh, that's a hundred pounds heavier but has the weight in the right places than a lighter car with the wrong um, weight distribution uh, reason why I think that is because we've tried everything and we've done everything wrong ourselves as well when I built my e28 which was a very very long time ago more than 15 years ago I think around 15 years ago uh, that was one of the first really purpose-built drift cars in our country because back then everybody was just driving E36 M3s which was back then like kind of like a recent 30 grand car so the guys were a little more um, a little more rich they ran like E36 M3s and everybody else was running E30s or E34s uh, which were basically just like the E34s or like semi road cars like 535s and M5s uh, Crazy to think if these cars are like 50 60 grand right now, but I once did a drifting event in Belgium and about I would say There were maybe 30 cars there 10 of them were E30 325s 10 of them were E34 M5s or 535s and the rest was E36 M3 There's maybe one or two Nissans um, so it's really crazy like all those cars were completely road worthy um, so that's kind of how it started out in Europe because those cars had LSDs from the factory nobody was welding this with them but I digress about the weight distribution thing so I built that E28 
which was a M535i, an original M535i, which would be a really valuable car even back then, but it was in really bad shape. It had a lot of corrosion, um, and it it was one of those cars that was begging to be turned into a race car or drift car. I bought it from one of my friends um, who had really, he had a lot of cars, so he kind of like, uh, let it like I would let it go to waste a little bit. So I picked up that car and I had I had the idea to turn it into a real proper drift car. So what I did is I removed everything from the back. Uh, E28s have the tank below the spare wheel well, like uh, E34s. I removed everything, removed the spare wheel well, which back then was kind of like special. People said like, "Whoa, what are you doing? You're cutting out the the area for the spare wheel because it was like <laughs> not a lot of people were doing that back then," um, and we cut all of that stuff out and I went as far as even removing the exhaust. So the exhaust actually stuck out the rear, uh, I, like out of this door. So we had the exhaust coming in right behind the driver's seat. Uh, so it was like in the, in the transmission tunnel, it came out right behind the driver's seat. Uh, I boxed that in later because at first we had it just open, which is of course a huge mistake because it was super loud in the car, kind of weird because the, the pipe was sticking out of the door but the, the muffler itself resonates and gives off a lot of heat and a lot of sound as well so it was extremely loud inside the car uh, so that's one of those lessons learned um, but i did that so all the weight would stop in front of the rear axle so there was no weight in front of the rear axle um, and uh, the car still had the uh, m30 which is the 12 valve three and a half liter motor up front which isn't as ridiculously heavy a motor as people say. Um, I think they're around four, 430, 440 pounds because it's only a 12 valve, it only has one cam. But on the E28, just like the E30, it sits pretty far forward. And that really kind of like messed with the car. It drifted really easily. I still have the car. It was probably one of the easiest cars to drift ever. Um, it was very, very, very light. I think I got it on 2,300 pounds or, or something like that. Very, very light, but uh, the weight distribution didn't make it that fast anymore. So it was kind of like, because the whole car was really light and the engine still has a certain weight. Like you can't shave much weight from the engine. Of course, we had the radiator and all that stuff up front. So um, that car was probably, I don't remember exactly when we put it on the scales, but it was like, 58, 42 or something like that. Um, so that, that car, it drifted really easily. Uh, transitions were really easily, but it wasn't really, really fast. Like it didn't really accelerate hard and drifting and everything. Back then, nobody had gripped up cars. We ran really big tires on that car. So it was like kind of fast because of the tire, because everybody was on a 235, we were on a 265. But it, it wasn't really uh, a, a good concept. And then it really opened my eyes for weight distribution, um, but also center of gravity. And that's, for me, that's like one of the keys when I build a car right now is how do we get the center of gravity of that car as low as possible? That's a really cool friend of mine driving there. I wish I could show you guys. He's got this really cool, uh, I think it's a 79 truck, like a... Uh, uh, CK uh, body, really cool, really cool guy. So, you're in the video, buddy. Uh, so, uh, well, not because I didn't take any uh, footage of it. Maybe I may I could pull some footage of that truck up in the screen. Maybe you guys will like it. It's kind of rare in the Netherlands. Anyways, so center of gravity is super important to me these days because it also affects other values. And we're not going to go too deep into that, but if you start looking into um, the setup of cars, you'll find out things like anti-squat, anti-roll, all that stuff. And that's hugely affected by center of gravity. And for me, that's super important. I like now to have a lot of mechanical grip in the rear of the car uh, with an E46 or E36. You're always gonna have a lot of mechanical grip because it's a trailing arm car. But I like to keep the center of gravity really, really low. That's also why I like to run the V8s. So everything that's heavy in my car basically sits like almost under elbow length because if you look at um, my V8 car that motor is so, like the top of the motor like the top of the uh, cam cover sits lower than the cutout in the scuttle panel or the firewall where normally the heater can go so that's how incredibly low that engines like seven eight or like probably 
seven or eight centimeters lower easily than the BMW engine. Um, I can measure it completely if, if you guys are really interested in it. Uh, and because it's a V8, it has a central camshaft. So inside that motor, it also has a very good um, weight distribution. So everything that's heavy in the motor, the crank, the cam, that's all in the center of the motor. So the heads are really light. Uh, it's a really compact, short engine. And because it's an iron motor, uh, that motor is around uh, 440 uh, pounds. Uh, so just a little over 200 kilos, ready to go. Uh, if you look at uh, 2JZ, that's around 450, 460 pounds. But that's, um, that, of course, requires uh, intercooler piping, all those kinds of things. So all the stuff that you bolt on a 2JZ to make it go fast is going to be uh, making it a lot uh, heavier. Uh, also, my car doesn't have an oil cooler because it's an iron motor. We never had the need to run an oil cooler. If you look at an LS, an LS is a little bit uh, lighter even than that. So the LS is around 420 pounds. Uh, M50 is uh, 400 uh, pounds. Uh, that's all like top to bottom completely uh, ready to go. So that's a pretty light uh, motor, the M50 of course. The turbo motors are gonna weigh a little bit more, like I said, when, when all is said and done. Um, the M50 is a really, really light motor, but like we discussed last time, it has a very short deck height. It means that there's not a lot of material between the center of the crankshaft uh, and where the cylinder head sits. Um, so that's also why it's, uh, of course, a light motor. Uh, the 2JZ and the uh, Chevrolet motors have a taller deck. 2JZ has a really tall deck. That's also why it's a little bit uh, heavier. If you uh, compare those things together, 2J also has a really heavy crank. That's also why they are so extremely reliable, of course. Um, so that's one of those things where you need to think about. Um, so if, if you look at the concepts, like if you have a turbo car these days, you kind of need to put the radiator in the rear uh, to have a good uh, weight balance. Um, if you look at my M50 turbo car, you can check out the, the build video of that. Uh, that's around 2700 pounds i can go a little lighter with that car because it has gutted steel doors it doesn't have any carbon fiber or, or um, fiberglass doors it's just steel doors um, and my uh, and that car was like when we put it on the scales for the first time it was already like 50 50 like it was really close like a 0.1 percent difference or something that has a radiator in the back the radiator sits where the back seat normally would sit and it has ducting as you guys all know everybody's seen that car it has ducting uh, coming from the floor so it's really important for me to get that radiator uh, because especially when it's completely filled with fluid and all the pipes and all the stuff going through it that's like probably going to be around 40 pounds or something like that um, it's also going to sit up front of course up front's going to be a little bit lighter because you're going to have uh probably uh maybe a two gallon or a gallon and a half less um uh fluid in there so that's what is like six or eight pounds difference uh, it's also nice to have a little bit more fluid of course because it's easier to keep the, the temperatures under control but that's an important thing if you look at the concepts and you also need to think about uh, how that's going to affect your weight distribution how it's going to affect the total weight of the car it's going to be a little bit heavier um, with the rear mount radiator of course um, so I know very, very little people really think about these things unless they're building a pro car. And even the guys with pro cars, they're kind of like hooked on a certain motor. They're like, oh, I'm a huge 2JZ guy, like Ryan Literal is a big RB guy. So he's, if he builds a car, he's not like, oh, I'm going to take an LS or I'm going to take an RB. It's just that's like him. If you say Ryan Literal, you say RB. If you say James Dean, you say 2JZ. So it's not like those guys really, they're, they're not going to do V8 cars, as simple as that. So... Um, but keep that in mind if you really have a blank mind there is a couple in America I do see people that have a real blank mind like in Europe I've never ever encountered that uh, even my best clients that are really smart guys that are really interested in uh, winning and interested in having a really good car they the first thing that, that they, they, they change chassis before they change motors they're gonna be like okay so I'll go from an S chassis to an E90 but it has to stay 2JZ, you know, it's almost like they're married to their motor, it's almost like religious, which is fine, and it makes sense because you have the knowledge and you have all the spare parts and all the stuff from that motor, 
in America, it seems to be more people that have a real blank mind. They're like, okay, I'm going to build this car for pros back. We're going to build this car for clutch kickers. What am I going to do? I'm going to take an LS or am I going to take a 2J or am I going to take a K swap or whatever? Um, I really, really appreciate that in America. It's really smart. Uh, that's actually how an actual race team would think about these things. And uh, take, take all the elements in the equation. Like if you do a turbo car, it definitely needs to be a rear mount radiator because you're going to have a lot of weight up front. It's going to be fragile up front because you need to put the intercooler, the power steering cooler, uh, the oil cooler and the radiator all in front. So it becomes like a fragile package. If one of them takes a hit, they'll probably all get, um, get damaged and you need to mount them regulations all prescribed. You need to mount them within the confines of the frame rail. So you can like move oil coolers outside in front of the wheels and stuff. It's going to be a really, really uh, tight package. But you also need to understand that if you put it in the back, uh, you need to run the, the lines to the back. And if you guys look at the video that we're doing right now on the M62 supercharger car, that can be a little challenging um, to do that. It's not really super simple, um, especially in the engine bay, routing them correctly, routing those big lines. You can see how we've done it on the M50 turbo. Uh, I like to run dash 20 lines through the engine bay certain applications you can also run dash 16. Um, I want that to stay like flexible and stuff. Uh, so if you pull the motor, you can like take it off and like uh, pull, pull them up so that all the fluid does come out. But if you add all that up, like it's also going to be a little bit more crowded under the car. Of course, a V8 car has two pipes coming out of the motor on each side of the transmission. A turbo car will not have that. It will have one down pipe, one exhaust. So you can run the the coolant lines on the other side on the floor um, but it's always going to be a little bit of fabrication um, so take that into consideration like what I really like is the V8 cars with the radiator out back like we're doing with the NASCAR S14 right now and like Chelsea Denova has on his car and like uh, HDK had on their cars but that's the most crowded thing to do like your floor pan is going to be super crowded but those cars will have the absolute best uh, weight distribution you can go to uh, 48, 52, so 52 out back. Um, it really suits uh, driving, especially right now with the, with the grip war going on. Uh, really, really um, nice layout. I'm really uh, very curious how that's going to be with the NASCAR S14. But in general, if you talk about weight distribution, if you take a car from the factory, like I said in a previous video, uh, Mark for Supra E46 M3 or MX-5, uh, Miata, as Americans call it, uh, they're almost 50-50 from the factory. Even an E34, which is kind of a big, heavy car, is almost 50-50 from the factory. When you start building that into a, not a pro car, so like a pro-am car or a drift week car, or I really love that drift week car is starting to be a thing right now, a uh, missile car, then you're usually going to be removing more weight from the back, uh, and you're not really going to move anything from the front. Like if it's not a full pro car, what are you going to take away from the front? Like people will add a bash bar, but that's usually heavier than the factory structure. Uh, you still need a radiator up front. You still need everything up front. Like most guys will leave the ABS in there, all that stuff. Um, so in the rear, you're going to remove the trunk, uh, everything that's inside the trunk, uh, your spare wheel, your tools, all that stuff. You're going to remove the rear seat, uh, parcel shelf, all kinds of things. And it's not a lot of weight but it's gonna mess up the weight distribution of that car. If I take a look at my Drift Week M3, that's basically a standard car with suspension stuff on it. And it's brilliant. It's like, of course, I wanted to have 100 horsepower more most of the time, but um, the balance in that car is crazy good. Like you have no idea how well that drifts. And I found it out uh, in 2002, 2003, when I first started uh, driving E46 M3s on the track, the balance of those cars, completely standard, is so good. It's crazy. And it's for us, it's a lot of work to get cars into that balance. Like my V8 car is close to that balance because it has the V8 up front, which is, um, if, you, if everything is said and done, if you compare it to the engine bay of my Drift Week M3, my V8 Pro car is lighter because it, of course, has carbon uh, Kevlar hood, carbon Kevlar fenders. Um, it has a bash bar and a crash structure, a tubular structure, but it's all chromoly, all thin wall. So if you if you take the weight of that uh, engine bay uh, or basically everything on that car in front of the dashboard, 
my pro car is going to be lighter than my drift week car but um, of course there's also a lot of stuff that you want to have on the drift week car like you want to have ac on that car um, and it's it's kind of like a thing like the more bizarre and more pro you make the car the less suitable it's going to be for traveling and the less easy it's going to be to get parts and stuff like if you run a really weird radiator in there like super cool custom-made radiator uh, like brian had in a clown shoe you you want to you need to have a spare on drift week which really sucks you don't want to be carrying a radiator around the whole drift week so it's kind of those those things you need to think about those concepts uh, i think the v8 the way i have my car with the v8 up front radiator up front and the uh, the fuel cell all the way out back so just behind the rear bumper i really like the way that drives because it gives you the lowest center of gravity the absolute lowest center of gravity uh, my m50 turbo car has a little higher center of gravity because it has basically has the radiator sitting here where you can see the uh, the backrest of the of the rear seat so it's going to be a little higher of course you also need to have like some kind of um, breather or expansion tank that's mounted higher than radiator and it's all not, it's not like 20 pounds but all that little stuff it kind of adds up um i think i could get my so just recuperating um that those cars could be a little bit i think i think i could gain about 100 pounds out of both of those cars without sacrificing too much but um i think that those are two really good uh proofs of concept like the turbo with the radiator out back um it's a little bit heavier car also because of that despite the fact that uh, my m50 turbo uh, the engine is supposed to be a little bit lighter than the uh, small block chevrolet but it has the turbo mounted to it, it has the intercooler mounted to it it does have an oil cooler all those kinds of things like if you run a turbo car you need to run a pretty big oil cooler because all that oil gets heated up from running through the turbo um, and that car is is a little bit heavier i think if i would build them both so the the, the sedan car the m50 turbo car does not have a kevlar a kevlar body kit like the um, like the v8 car has and it's not cut off it doesn't have a cut off rear end um, so I, I think i could get them both roughly on the same weight um, but the weight distribution of the turbo car would be a little bit better but the center of gravity would also be a little bit higher and uh it's it's a little bit of what what, what you what do you like yourself like on the on bmw e46 and e36 and e30 like the gas tank is in a really good position like it's right in front of the rear wheels probably the best best position for a gas tank you can have but if you run a v8 or if you want to run a rear mount radiator that gas tank is going to be a little bit in the way for the exhaust and all those kinds of things like you could totally do that it's no problem at all like there's lots of race cars with the standard gas tank um, so th th that could definitely work but you need to find a way to convert that to an an uh, you also need to have like uh, uh, your fuel system and stuff which most people these these days put in the fuel cell it's really nice drop-in solutions that go inside the fuel cell um, I don't think that really exists for a pro car for a standard BMW application. So you're going to be um, you're going to be limiting yourself a little bit with that. Uh, I know Chelsea did something really smart. I think he, he changed the original tank, like he only used half of the tank. It's exactly like it's done in the uh, E46 that we have right now with the M60 Turbo or M60 Supercharger uh, that we're converting to uh, rear mount radiator right now. So keep those things in mind, um, summarizing a little bit. Uh, if you're having a clean, uh, a clean build from zero, you start with a clean slate. Um, think about this, that it, probably the lightest that you're ever going to be building is an LS-based car um, with the radiator uh, up front. That's going to be the absolute lightest car. You're probably going to be able to get that on 50-50 weight distribution. Uh, if you would move that radiator to the rear on that car, um, which is not necessary because it's not a turbo car, um, you would probably lose a little bit of center of gravity because you either need to put the fuel cell on top, it, it's provided you're going to run a fuel cell, you need to put the fuel cell on top of the rear axle uh, or um, you need to put it behind um, the differential like I did the my car, but then you need to put your radiator somewhere. 
Um, so you're probably going to have a little bit worse center of gravity when you're uh, when you're doing that. Uh, and if you're building a missile car or something that's not a pro car, keep in mind that it's very easy to remove a lot of weight from the back, but you're not going to be removing all the weight from the front. So you're probably making that car, you make it a little lighter, but you're also messing up the weight distribution a little bit. Um, there's also this whole myth about cutting a lot of steel out of cars. Um, a lot of people claim these insane weights. Like I, like I said, we weigh everything. So if somebody tells me like, oh, my car is, it's under, uh, 2,100 pounds. I'm like, oh, there's no way that that's possible. It's not possible. And they're like, yeah, we cut out every bracket and we cut out this and we cut out that. But like, check out the weight of a uh, hundred inch by 50 inch steel sheet in the thickness of uh, the material that's in a road car. Like if you take a sheet of metal that's the size of a normal house door, that's around 25 pounds. Uh, that's, that's not a lot. Like that's just, it's just a little uh, over 11 kilos. There's no way in hell that you're cutting the size of a house door worth of steel out of a car. It's just not possible. You can totally forget that because a partial shelf has a lot of holes in it, a lot of little things. The partial shelf is probably only 80% steel, like the rest of it is holes. And it's, it's probably gonna be around 30 inches by five inches. Um, so if you remove the whole partial shelf, all that stuff, you're probably gonna be gaining around maybe five pounds or something like that. Um, when we cut stuff out of cars, I always weigh what we cut out and I always post it online on Instagram. I always put a picture of the scales. I tell people, hey, guess how much weight this is? Like, it's just like not a lot. Like it's like the whole, everything you can cut out from the parcel shelf on the SGS and everything is way under 10 pounds. I think it's like 3.3 kilos, which is like around nine pounds or something like that. So, and people say, yeah, but it's free, but it also costs you a lot of time. Uh, so let's say if you just have a normal job and it takes you three, four hours to cut out all that sheet metal, if you would do overtime or nobody wants to hear this because people rather be tinkering on their car and working overtime or doing extra jobs, whatever. But if you would like spend three, four hours, um, that, that you're spending cutting out metal, if you, if you worked, uh, overtime and that you could maybe afford a little bit lighter wheels or something like that and that's where it, of course it really starts like wheels are so there's people that cut everything out of their car and they're like it's 2100 pounds it's 2100 pounds man it's super light and i'm like there's no way there's no way that, that car is 2100 pounds but whatever and then they have like cast wheels on there that i know that are like 40 pounds a piece you know and they're 100 bucks of course so that's why they have them but um you should really consider like not cutting out all those little things and buy really light wheels. Uh, you don't have to buy the most bizarre work wheels or th I don't even think that the work wheels are the lightest ones you can get. Um, but like, and this is again, something nobody wants to hear. Original wheels, BMW wheels from five series and seven series sometimes are extremely light because catch this, the 16 and 17 inch wheels of the older 5 and 7 series and the 18 inch wheels of the newer 7 and 5 series are usually forged. Also, nobody wants them because 18 inch on a new 5 or 7 series is really small. It's such a huge car. Nobody wants them. Everybody puts 20 inch or 21 inch M5 or blah, blah, blah wheels on them. So you buy those wheels for a couple hundred bucks and they're usually lighter than work wheels in the same size. Nobody wants it because they're like, oh, it's just a standard BMW wheel. It's boring. They're ridiculously light. If you take a look at my Driftweek M3 wheels, they're very, very light. Like I said in the last video, they're also the only wheels that Cricket from Drift HQ couldn't fix because they were way too strong. So OEM wheels is like, if you don't have a lot of money and you care about weight saving, it's, it's just way better to get like... Um, OEM wheels because a lot of the OEM wheels are really really light like the Corvette the the, the the five spoke wheels on the Corvette like that's like the standard go-to wheel uh, on the C6 that's an extremely light wheel that's a bizarrely light wheel people you won't believe how light that wheel is if you if you take it in your hands um, so that's one of those things like if you really care about weight saving 
um, it's there's a couple things you can save weight real easily. One of the doors, the doors of road cars are really heavy because they have a lot of stuff in them. You don't always have to buy carbon fiber or fiberglass doors. You can also gut the original doors. Keep in mind that when we did uh, E36, E46 builds, the fiberglass doors that we made ourselves were around 11 pounds. Fiberglass door, 11 pounds, which is very, very light for fiberglass. But if you put the door mechanism and the mirror on them, they doubled in weight. They doubled in weight. So the door latching mechanism, so where the door actually falls into, and the mirror were heavier than the whole fiberglass door. So all those small things you can save there. Like my uh, V8 car has really light, like the teardrop style mirrors, which I really love. You don't see anything in them. They're completely worthless as mirrors, but they're super, super light. Uh, and that's where you can save all weight. So doors is where you can save all weight. It's also on the outside of the car. It's a really important spot. Like you want to have the weight of the car ideally as low as possible and as much to the center as possible. Um, and that's that's kind of how it works. So keep that in mind, you know, like cutting out all those little brackets and all those things, it really isn't going to gain you much. Like it looks a lot cleaner in a pro car. We do it with really big, with 100,000 euro projects. Of course, we cut all this stuff out, but it's... It's not for ultimate weight saving, it's just to make it more clean. And if we do a rear mount radiator, we want to do some ducting or some things there. So we want to have all the original stuff that's not structural, we cut it out. But it's basically more for ease of fabrication and it looks really clean because you don't want to spend a hundred grand on a car and then not have it looking super clean. So that's kind of what it's like. Um, so there's not a huge gain in cutting out all those little things. Um, also keep in mind, if you cut everything out of the front and you go into... Uh, a tire stack or something then it, it can deform the whole chassis it can actually push the motor out of the mounts into the um, into the firewall so keep that in mind like most of the stuff that you remove up front you need to put something back that does the same thing uh, I'm not saying that all the OEM stuff is perfect but there's a lot of stuff in there if you take out the whole bumper structure um, you need to put something back you need to put the bash bar or something back and you'll be challenged to do that in the same way I think the Nissans have, like, if you look in S13, all that stuff with the headlights, uh, with the pop-up headlights, stuff, of course, all this stuff weighs little. Um, so you can gain a lot of weight there if you put fiberglass and stuff on there. ABS is technically always going to be heavier than fiberglass. If you put fiberglass bumpers and stuff on there, you're going to gain some. Um, but, like, don't go crazy with cutting out all the little things. If it's not a full pro car, if it's just a pro-am or a fun car, doesn't really make much sense and think about that proof of concept if you really care about the car being light it starts with what chassis am i going to take probably the lightest that you're ever going to be building a car with a good rear axle is going to be an ls e36 that's going to be the light so I, i'll say it right now i'll go on record the lightest you can build right now with a car where you can win dmac or you can win formula drift with is an ls based engine in an e36 Simple as that. If you really spend a fuck ton of money and you get an 800 horsepower uh, LS uh, NA, uh, you can leave the radiator in the front if you put turbocharger, supercharger, or whatever in there and move the radiator to the back. Uh, but that's kind of like, I'll, I'll say that, like the, the, the most, the best weight distribution, lightest car you can build right now is an E36 with an LS motor in it. Um, of course, not really one set. I totally get that. It, you can also see in FD that the cars that have been winning the last years were not the lightest cars. Um, they have the tire rule versus the weight, of course. Um, they, those guys have really good weight distribution. OD, um, of course, James Dean, uh, Chelsea's car, have really good weight distribution. The cars are a little heavier, but they have really good weight distribution. So that's a little bit more important. And those guys, they all opt for the heavier car on the bigger tire and you don't see many cars with a narrow tire and a lighter car you don't see many of them be successful in fd so that's it guys let me know what you guys think thanks for listening don't forget to take a look at our website as well einzel.nl we ship worldwide of course wise fab field suspension our own brand einzel gearboxes quick change differentials axles all kinds of things a lot of fabrication components, of course, air jacks, subframes for quick change, you name it. Drop us an email and we'll hook you up.